Hey, how you doing? Let's get on this. Okay, good. <clears throat> Right, that was a tough one. Let me see here. Did you do? Oh, ouch. Really? Hmm. Trying to figure this one out here, here, there. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, let me see here. Uh, do, 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 do. Really? Hmm. Huh. What did I mess up on here? So that's not it. Oh, because that wins a bishop. Ah, drat. Should have seen that. I think the reason this doesn't work is because he can actually block there and so that's why uh, this stops there and so then you can pick up the, the queen because it can't get there okay and let's see what did I where did I go wrong here Drat. It's a fork. I, I was thinking my mate. That that's a fork. Okay. Got to be on the game on that one. We'll try it again.
Okay, that one was a kind of tricky one. work out very well. Let me see here. Here. There. What did I miss on this one? Oh, it's that, because this is pinned, okay. Had the wrong takes. started Right. Well, that was a tough one. <clears throat> hmm. 
Hmm. Ah, pushing the pawn. Okay. Oh. Ouch. Try one last one, and whatever happens, then we'll get on to our thing. It's always good to do these tactical drills. Oops, here we are. Yeah, okay. Let me see here. See if I check here. Hmm, trat. Sometimes the <laughs> those are the harder ones. Oops, I gotta check here. And I grab the bishop. Okay, doki. Take there, take here, take there. Come on. There we go. Oh, really? Ouch. Uh, uh, uh. Are you st really? I thought for sure. That I thought for sure that that would. Ah, uh, that's fine. That should have worked with drawing the king away. With it, it must have been too slow. What did I? Is it this here? Oh. Okay, because you have to get rid of the. Okay. I was one check off from the from the crack one, okay. And now we'll get on to Jeremy Silman. Hey, one out of three isn't bad. We're we're gonna we'll step up our average. Okay. It's not the best, but let's see. Oh we already did that one. Okay. Did we do that one already? Yep. That we gotta do this one here. Is it that? No. Huh. 
Oh, just win the pawn. Ah, uh, that's silly of me. I should have just seen that. That wins the pawn. You get two passers, and there's really no way to stop that. Okay. Wow. Yeah, you got to be able to relax during those hard times. Okay. All right. Okay. Now we're in another section. At this point, the hard-working student, having read and mastered the material about block, uh, blockading past pawns, will um, basically use uh, Jeremy Silman's advice and triumphantly plant a knight in front of the enemy pawn and celebrate that his uh, blockade will ensure him excellent chances. <coughs> Then he realizes that his position doesn't seem to offer uh, th them anything. It, it, we don't see that. And he passively sits there. And then he goes, he says, what did I do wrong, basically? Which uh, Jeremy Soman, uh he says, uh, why, why isn't this working? Why is my opponent basically uh, crushing me or defeating me? Uh, and then the question, and then it goes, ah, the question would follow, how could this happen? And then he, he was saying, was, uh, did what I say actually work? The, does, uh, does the book basically tell me, and is it right? Basically, he's saying, is this, is what he's saying, Jeremy Silman's saying, correct? Does it actually work? Um... And then he said, calm down. Blocking the enemy pawn is extremely important, but I, I left out one small piece of the puzzle. If you do not have a form of active play, then you are doomed to a miserable defensive task that you probably won't recover from. So, even though you can blockade a pawn, or like a pass pawn, if that knight doesn't give you anything for blockading it, like we saw in our last game with Bobby Fisher, it how Bobby actually blockaded it and then won it and had activity during that whole entire time, and his knight did a bunch of stuff. If your pieces don't do that, then you're not uh, your pieces aren't active, and what will eventually happen is you'll sit there passively while the seconds click off on your clock, and you'll say man I missed something here what's going on I thought the blockading idea works a hundred percent of the time it does that's what Jeremy Summers tried to say and now what we have to do is take it to the next level and, that, and we're gonna have a game Rubenstein uh, versus G Slavi 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 I'm, I'm probably not pronouncing it exactly correct, but Rubenstein is black. Oops, there we go. There we go. Let's get the right date. Okay, and we'll get the cities correct. Okay, let me see if we have this right. Uh, let me see. Perfect. Perfect, perfect. All right, nice. Okay. E4, <coughs> E5, F4. Bishop uh, c5, knight f3, detect the pawn, d6, c3, <coughs> knight c6, bishop b5, that's a pin, 
bishop d7, d4. And I know what you're thinking. Why doesn't uh, he just take, right? Well, then you can actually take there. After bishop takes, takes, the bishop has to go back. And then you can actually push up this way. if you wanted to. But then he has this type of play and you could start developing. I don't know if it's a hundred percent good but um, Black didn't want to have that happen. He wanted to keep as much tension in the center as Black could. Uh, F takes E, D takes E, and then d5. See, uh, Rubenstein didn't want to basically go into a position like this, which would uh, have an isolated pawn and then he wouldn't have the ability to castle. So d5 keeps the potential of this pawn still falling off the board and uh, potentially getting these pawns going like that. Queenside counters counter attacks. Knight b8. Nobody likes to have a knight to b8. He's going to have to somehow reroute this uh, bishop and get the knight in, but he can't really do that at the pre at this present moment. Bishop d3. We don't, he doesn't want to trade off his bishop because then if he did, the knight would come into d7 and come in with the tempi. We don't want that. Queen e8. <coughs> and then knight to a3. The idea of knight e3 is, of course, you see knight to uh, c4 attacking the bishop and the pawn and potentially winning the pawn. This bishop now covers uh, uh, e4 so that even after black plays this move you can retreat back and the pawn still covered. So knight f6 <coughs> knight c4 Rubenstein's coming in with that idea knight g4. Now the knight is defending the pawn. So knight and but guess what? Uh, Rubenstein acquired an, an important um, imbalance. He has the two uh, bishops for um, so he's got basically the, the dark squared bishop and what's gonna start happening is he's gonna want to try to uh, basically get the center opened and get his bishops activated. So you're going to see a lot of um, potential opening of uh, diagonals for the bishop. A takes B. And black did acquire something that's really interesting, an open A file, half open A file. So got to give something to get something right there. Um, knight to f8 or f6 and then uh, Rubenstein castled and then black castled and bishop to g5 now uh, Rubenstein took potential for a pin and later on maybe some, maybe we can get a bit queen here and then emphasize the pin a little more right there and then take a scope of potentially opening up the king and causing some uh, damage on, on the king. So, um, so, okay, queen d6. Trying to get, he got out of the pin. Queen e1, like what we talked about. Knight e8. Getting out of that as quick as uh, can be. And then bishop to e3. And there's no reason to allow a gain to tempo with either that move or, or this move here. We don't want any tempo gains there. 
f6. So now black did play that to support e5, but still it didn't come with a uh, tempo f against white. So white actually gets the move now, and Rubenstein plays uh, c4. This is a really interesting continuation. It has a couple ideas behind it. One idea is if uh, black is thinking about playing this move here, now the uh, d pawn is protected. And uh, so c5, and then a3. But so we, we should go back and note that if this were to be played, we can actually take here, take here, take here, and take there, and then uh, potentially just retreat our, our bishop back to uh, d2 and come in, take scope on the uh, pawn. And so the knight would basically have to come in and guard here. The bishop would, would be uh, positioned good there. And white has the advantage at this moment because of how what the better structure the uh, that white has. So that's why black didn't want to go down that uh, route. Now Rubinstein's going to try to... Um, lever the center open with uh, b4 and uh, potentially queen to f2 with a double hammer attack on uh, c5 after takes. So you always you have to be on the lookout for those uh, type of that type of play. So the knight comes to a6 which protects uh, the idea of this here because now it's protected twice and it would be attacked twice. So Rubinstein reroutes uh, his knight and he is potentially trying to get a knight into uh, f5 after the bishop trades the rook would take because we don't want to fracture our, our structure. We'll have a barricade, we'll have the two bishops, white will, so there'll be a huge imbalance at that point. Let me get a drink here. <coughs> One second. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, appreciate your patience on that. It's getting over whatever I have, so I may cough every once in a while, just a little bit. I uh, appreciate your patience on that, and. This the queen was actually a barricader of um, d6. So what now the queen's trying to do is allow a knight to get there. So Rubenstein's gonna have to um, get his pawns protected, and that's why a3 was played. A3 actually has a dual purpose stops the knight from coming into b4 and then the rook doesn't have anything to attack and this rook now protects and so now uh, Rubenstein could la uh, launch a potential queenside counterplay. Knight d6 like what we talked about the barricade and then Rubenstein played uh, g4 the idea here is that the knight uh, wants to come into f5 and this will be an uh, potentially maybe even an exchange sack maybe an exchange sack could potentially be in the works too because in a closed position a knight is actually more valuable than a rook right now so even if he were to get a rook here and this knight were to take the rook and then the pawn took back. It would there'd be a lot of space spatial bind for um, white uh, to uh, uh, use as an attacking potential. So you always just got to consider those type of ideas. <clears throat> Your opponent's not going to consider that type of a sacrifice. 
it'll shock them and sometimes they just take automatically and then you get a really good position because they're they're thinking what is this player doing what what's what is white doing basically what's white doing and, and then they just take it for some reason I don't know why I've won a couple games with a peace sacrifice that way so just don't always take look and see why your opponent is playing that move here we go so the knight comes in <clears throat> bishop takes and then the pawn uh, pawn takes so now there's a pretty big uh, clamp down on g6 and so the king's gonna start thinking about coming up to king to d uh, to h2 get a rook to g1 and then potentially try to um, look for an attack here and then a queen there it's gonna be this type of a play and you're gonna see a lot of that going on so knight to b8 uh, and this knight's gonna try its darndest to get uh, back in the fray <clears throat> a4 this does a couple ideas even if the knight were in the rook to come over white now can play um, b4 so let's say that this happened b4 can actually be played now now the bishop is relieved of duty protecting uh, c4 and uh, b5 is under a complete ownership of white so now all we have to do is kind of worry about e4 and that relieves one of the uh, tensions are one of the weaknesses that white had so now black's theory of two weaknesses has been uh, eliminated and if black tries something like this black's getting into a pretty bad bind there's king h2 if the queen tries to come over here you could actually first bring your queen in keep the bishop guarding this and then double and then double and maybe even triple up on uh, here and then play bishop h6 and then this bishop is a beautiful defensive piece remember what we talked about it's not considered a tall pawn it's a useful bishop remember there's three types of bishops there's an active bishop which um, is a bishop that the pawn it's outside the pawn chain but the pawns are on the same color as the bishop but it's outside the pawn chain that's considered active doesn't mean that it's a, um, a one that's participating in the uh, play just means that it has a lot of mobility then you have a <clears throat> useful bishop that may be doing defensive uh, duties at this present moment which would be the d3 bishop and then you have a bishop that is really really bad it can't get outside the pawn chain it's entombed inside the pawn and that's considered a tall pawn the bishop is so okay so now that we have a4 knight d7 <clears throat> black has firmly and permanently blocked blockaded d uh the d5 the d pawn and his d6 knight should, accor uh, as according to our discussion about blockade, can be viewed as a like a very genius piece, a very intelligent, wise piece that's really helping out. Like a, it, it's a hero. It sounds so nice, yet it's also very, it's also very, very wrong. The problem is that black has no counterplay which means that he has uh, he has to quietly wait around and hope that white can't find a way to break into his position though a uh, passive placed player can draw from time to time one should usually um, kind of slowly build up and your opponent will uh, break over time because of the pressure and uh, just be relentless on building up your uh, position. I don't believe, I'm not talking about cat, uh, cat and mouse type of stuff. I'm just saying don't, uh, because a position looks drawn, just give up. Try to uh, push to see if you can get a win. 
And in this type of position, black's in a passive position. So what you can do is slowly get your pieces better. And then uh, at the right moment, drop, as I like to say, Thor's hammer down on, on the position and win. Or, or we call it pulling the trigger, which is to open up uh, the position as well. You, there's a lot of different terms that I like to call it. Is uh, you know what I mean? Are as what one of them is like throw everything in the kitchen sink at it. I like that phrase too. But just be ready for uh, your chance to like attack. Here we go. And this is the first sign that a uh, Rubenstein is ready to uh, basically go for a pretty big breaking attack on his opponent. Shouldn't black should black can't do uh since black can't do anything white can quietly and safely build up his idea attacking position before opening up the position on the king side so a3 we talked about this move b3 rook f7 <coughs> rook g2 and now we have uh king either uh h2 or h1 King h8, King h2, Knight f8, Queen h4, oops, and this slowly is slowly, slowly building. h6, Rook f to g1, Knight h7. See, the idea is, the reason this is a strong move is because if that were to be played, now you can actually take and it's protected twice and only attacked once. And then what eventually would happen is something like this, and then you're, you're just getting totally uh, disintegrated at this point. Your position's collapsing. And potentially, probably better rather than queen takes. I like bishop takes. Because now the rook has to go back. <clears throat> and of course, we love when we can just basically jam a pawn down the board. And now we're, we're just, we're waiting. And this is going to be mate, basically. You can, you have so many different mating moves you have all this here ah that's 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 the one move that you can't do so g5 so anything but g5 like that's mate that's mate and that's mate the only not mate is uh, g5 because that allows the king to have a it blocks your rooks so h7, black has the idea of potentially outposting a knight on uh, g5. Let's see, we're on move 31. Rook g, uh, g6. <coughs> a to um, f8. I know what you're thinking. Why not just drop this knight, right? The problem is bishop takes, takes, and then takes. Pawn can't take. If the queen were to take, then the rook takes and the king's pinned. So this just doesn't work because of the pin. Queen g4. Now we have this beautiful peace sacrifice with mate and three. Knight g5 is is could be played here. H4 to attack the knight. Queen uh, d8. Giving up. But he uh, he's actually toast at this point, 
if he tries just retreating back here then the beautiful uh, takes here set up for unstoppable attack knight to uh, e8 bishop to uh, e3 followed by this move up the board and you're in a winning position so the knight's gone h takes h takes king uh, g2 with the idea of uh, transporting an another rook over and then a queen over king g8 rook h1 rook e8 trying to give some room to the and then queen to h5 <clears throat> and there's really no way to uh, stop the crushing move basically this is where white resigns so we'll put the mark of a bad uh, white is better white is winning actually so that we know where it stopped so we'll just take a quick um, analysis of the position if we were to check here you'd have to I'm not sure if checking is the best <sighs> this is a tough one because um, Try to see if check here, here, queen up, and then the rook comes over. Did our did our attack kind of fizzle out here? Just trying to see where I where I might have gone awry. Got to see what the correct. Um, so bit interesting. this were pushed you actually have a check here hmm so this is the okay I think I kind of see what what's going on here we're rerouting our rook in here and then playing this move interesting okay oh wow that's just nothing but pain and more pain so we can we'll just st stop it here wow yeah I think uh, our opponents would make us prove our position so that's a really interesting one Of course, the uh, of course, the idea of having no play needs to be applied uh, to the side with the passed pawn. The passed pawn is firmly blockaded, and the blockading side has all the remaining play. Then the blockader gets to have all the fun, and we don't like that. Okay, let's get. This is the last uh, game here, and then our uh, 
think it's our chapters done at this point. So let's get these uh, uh, players' names put in. This is Bronstein. sure I have the spelling of this of this name right oops so I got an eight an A there perfect excellent job let's get on to this game <coughs> okay C4 C5 so it's the English Symmetrical position. Bronstein is actually black here, so we probably should turn the board so that we can look at it from Bronstein's position. Okay. Castles, castles. D4, C3, and Rook B1. I know what you're thinking. Why don't you just take, right? Well, then uh, White gets a really good majority on the uh, kind of a little bit into the Queen side. And you're also thinking, why why doesn't white just take, right? Well, this is why. Because that attacks. And now white's structure is wrecked. So the, the, bit, the rook moves to b1 to get off. And now this idea of taking is in play. b6. Bishop a3. Bishop b6 to uh, hone on this weak a2 pawn. Knight g5. Bishop d7. A lot of us would just uh, grab this here. And then after basically the rook here we you could play here and then play that and then, then you get a fork so you can't really do that so you have you'd actually have to go back and then white would be able to win and you'd have these kinda un unattractive um, doubled pawns you are up a pawn but with uh, one move, you're back. They're back in the fray. So I don't. I think that's why uh, Bronstein just didn't didn't go for the bait or the the decoy of his opponent. <coughs> and then d5 to attack the knight. Knight e5.
Let's see four. Uh, now the pawn is protected. And then h6 to kick this knight out. Knight f3. Um, e5. And e4. See, what he wants to do is have this happen here. And then after the exchanges, this is uh, still under fire here via these two pieces. And so a rook would have to basically come over and hold there. And we, he didn't want that. So White's trying to keep his pass pawn protected. But Bronstein is going to uh, um, get his uh, knight probably to b7 to uh, d6. OK. Oh, f5, he's trying to, he's going to, and this is kind of like a king's Indian, a kid kind of position. And uh, f pawn gets uh, hurled up the board sometimes. He kind of becomes the hero in this position to leave a lever open for the artillery to be useful at that point. D2 and then H5 this should be 2 trying to take scope on this and then F4 and he's basically trying to squeeze um, his opponent to ruins basically and potentially now the queen could actually infiltrate in and cause a lot of chaos let's just say and the queen infiltrates that far in and then you can get um, potentially bishop here takes and you get a massive attack uh -uh, not fun for your opponent let's see where are we 18 okay E4, F5, Knight D2, H5, Bishop F4, Bishop C3. Knight B7, we don't want to allow uh, Black to open up the position, I mean White to open up the position taking our Knight. Okay, um, A4. A5. Very, um, uh, that move really makes a pretty weak position spot for a knight to jump into B5. Knight F3. Rook E8. Queen D2. Knight d6. And this uh, pawn is becoming very soft. Queen uh, b2. Rook b8. And he's going to win this pawn here. Bishop d3 to hold here. This might seem to be good for white as he has permanent pressure on b6. In the future, uh, no, uh, pressure, on, that's right, pressure on b6 and e5. And his pass d pawn, though blockade, blockaded, might act as an endgame insurance in the future. 
However, Bronstein had a different way of looking at this uh, position. He realized that once he gave back uh, to once once he gave back up to both uh, B six and E five, thus making them invulnerable. White would suddenly find himself without any play at all. In the in that case, a pawn advance on the king side where he's all he already holds a clear spatial spatial advantage would sweep the white king away so knight to uh f4 and or f2 knight f2 2 f f7 <laughs> that's that's funny i was thinking white and black now uh keeps a hold of this three times so uh White's starting to lose any traction of, you know, speed of their attack. Taking care of e5, for the moment, the black queen will remain on uh, d8 and defend b6. Queen c2, uh, g5. Beforehand, when the queen was on uh, b2, g5 was uh, unplayable, basically. Because you you could, uh, let's say a rook were to move, let's say rook here. This could be played, but the knight could actually come in and then takes, I don't think it's strong enough. And you lose the tension it gets here. So maybe it still could be played. So it still could be played even if the queen were not um, moving. The idea behind this is potentially to win a pawn, but I don't see that it actually works. And White's starting to lose their energy, as I like to say. Rook b2. Trying to double up rooks, g4. Now uh, black is going to uh, basically, as a tidal wave, our riptide um, uh, sweeps away, you know, whatever's, uh, it rips it into the sea, basically all that. And our hits against uh, um, rock, and basically it starts falling apart. This is what uh, G4 does. Black's going to try to break White's um, attack on E4 or E5, and then the knight can get involved, the queen can get involved, and boy, it's not looking too um, pleasant for White. Now bishop to uh, f1, or f8, exclaim. Black superiority on the king side is now obvious. The, this bishop prepares to become a defending hero of uh, b6. Uh, Rook f, b1. Bishop d6, knight to f1, and then bishop c2. And now this bishop is is has went from as the in the Hercules went from zero to hero in one uh, uh, in three moves. It went from here to here to here. Now it's like the ultimate warrior. And it's willing to do whatever it takes to win. Suddenly both b6 and uh, e5 are rock solid. And white is left wondering what to do now. <laughs> because what do you do? You really, there is nothing really much to do for white. Um, both sensitive spots, the e5 pawn and b6 pawn uh, squares and pawns are now permanently defended. And the only person, the only player that has any activity is Bronstein. And he's going to be able to push with f3. Uh, or maybe um, slowly go h4, 
G, maybe G3, and then uh, F3, and just start uh, just basically breaking the king side's uh, fortress down. Yikes. Uh, having acquired his defensive plan, it's now time to go for the king, for the KO on the knockout of the king. So queen d1, <laughs> um, the queen is kind of now like going to be the defender of the king. The knights in defensive mode, the bishops potentially will start being defenders. And white's going to have to turn their attention to the safety of their king. And one really does not want to ever have that happen. Now the queen, the almighty queen, could actually come into play. Oh boy, black, uh, white's in a uh, pretty bad predicament now. When you can get her majesty, the you know, the basically the big gladiator piece into play, you're in trouble. A logical and strong move, though he could have considered playing. Um, let me see here. Back here, uh, instead of queen, there, Bronstein could have considered knight to uh, g5, which is also an interesting continuation. With f3, h4. Ninety-two. I know what you're thinking. Just take here, right? The only problem with that is you get the surprise of your life with uh, this move here, and the position's just going to start flooding uh, open. Floodgates are going to start uh, widening, and after this move happens, the knight comes in. And it's like, hello, <laughs> it's a little too late now. And if the king were to come up here, you do have uh, now queen. And this is now in, in play. <laughs> it's like, wow, the floodgates, the wall has been breached, and uh, every single soldier that you have is just flooding into the fight. Boy, that would be fun to play, I gotta say. That would be really fun. Now, G3. And this is an actually an interesting position. If H there, it'd be met by um, a very nice bishop sack. Exclaim here. And now if pawn takes, the knight comes crushing in. And then if the king comes up, the knight comes in to a, uh, F2, attacking the bishop. So the queen basically has to reroute there. And then uh, H3 comes in and it's like, whoa, what type of monster just, you know, came into the attack. And let's say he moves back. Now you can actually bring your queen in. And the uh, idea is a check. You could, if you wanted to, play this move here and uh, trying to think, how would we... How do we set this up? Oh, st silly me, just queen, and and the position basically is lost. And then you just move your queen up there. Now you're threatening, and boy, wow, that that is power. That's that's I like that idea. I think uh, I think knight to g5 would have been a very interesting move. Let me see where are we. So F3. Um, uh oh, did I? Queen there. Oh, Bishop E2. Okay. Bishop E2. That uh, wasn't uh, played as Bishop E2. And then F3. That's that's the sitch. I had I was one move two. And then uh, D D6 double question mark blunder. 
White didn't know really what to do here because White's getting a little nervous. White panicked at the sight of the king being swarmed by enemy pieces and going completely berserk. He should have played um, G takes and uh, after knight to g5, king h1, g takes f, bishop d3, just calm down, though it might be admitted that black retains an extremely strong attack after rook to f2, I mean king f2, knight to um, e3, and rook g8, it's not, um, there's not enough yet to merit total victory, but white panicked and got and went into reactive mode. And so now a uh, piece just falls off the board. Knight d6. Uh, there goes the pawn. So no more pass pawn for white. Knight g3. Queen f7. Is trying to win a whole nother pawn. Rook d2. Bishop uh, c6. First safety in his bishop, and then uh, going after the pawn. Rook b d1. Rook b uh, d8. Now we need is one piece defending. And then queen to e3. and queen to g6 and you have this under fire right now you have this under fire you have uh, this under fire via that and the bishop is attacking so you, you have just th these two uh, positions are under fire for uh, black and there's really no way for white to uh, Hold blacks uh, taking going to be taking one of them, maybe even both, and it's just a tremendous problem. There's really no way to hold. Uh, there's no way to get at this pawn via bishop takes because the rook would take. Wow, that's that's just a brilliant game. Now we're going to summarize up, and then I got to say adieu. So. Let's summarize what we've learned in this chapter. A uh, pass pawn can be a static powerhouse or a dynamic winner. Thus, understanding it will also improve your understanding of static and dynamic positions. Remember, there could be static, you can have a static setup, your opponent can have a dynamic setup in, in, in the game. And if you can neutralize uh, their uh, dynamic position, which means take all their counterplay away, you then can go back to your idea of a static attack and uh, then uh, take the pawn and win the game. But a static attack is more slow and you're basically locking down a piece, making weaknesses and then uh, eyeing those weaknesses. It's more positional. But not all the time, <laughs> but but the majority of the time, probably 90% of the time, it's positional play. So you can't always say that static play is positional all the time. A pass pawn uh, discourse uh, is the ideal training ground, or discussion is the ideal training ground uh, for the concept of blockaders. Blockade. Three, a pawn majority ultimate goal is certainly is a certain of a pass pawn. So if you have a majority, you're wanting to get a you're wanting to trade down to get a pass pawn. Understanding pass pawns vastly increases your understanding of pawn majorities too. Uh, four, a pass pawn, even a protected pass pawn, can often turn out to be a serious disadvantage if it can be blockaded like we've seen and your opponent has active play and you don't. A pawn, pass pawn usually shines bright in king and pawn endgames and queen endgames since in this case the lone enemy queen can't maintain a blockade on, it, on its own. 
So if you get a queen and pawn, pass pawn type of setup, the queen, even though it's in front for a while, cannot hold the blockade forever. It's going to have to trade off eventually when um, it gets attacked and the pawn has to take. So just keep that in the forefront. A queen can't blockade. If you're a queen versus queen, let's say you have uh, a pass pawn, the king's too far away to help uh, the opponent's king, but your king and queen are there, you're going to end up winning. The ideal plan for a player with an advanced pa uh, pass pawn is to exchange all minor pieces, leaving both sides with a queen and rook versus queen and rook versus queen and rook. This makes the blockade of the passer uncomfortable since the queen and rook are not ideal blockaders. Note that the queen should usually be retained since that the pieces powers piece power makes the defending king in a, in a particular in a defensive rather than in the defense rather risky. So <laughs> It's kind of a mouthful there. I think what uh, Jeremy Soman is saying there is you don't want to trade off. If if you have the pass pawn, you got to be uh, careful trading off. Um, you, you want to trade off queens sometimes, get into a rook of um, rooks, and then try to uh, emphasize using your king because then your king can get involved and you're going to have a really good position. But when the queens are on the board, the king has to stay sheltered for a while. Okay, so two, four, six. This is seven. There are three kinds of useless pass pawns. There is a life and a death struggle going on, and the pawn has absolutely nothing to do with it. So number one, there is basically a humongous struggle for the tide of the war on one side, but the pass pawn has zilch to nothing to do with it. That's one bad. A successful blockade re, um, basically renders it to be useless. A successful blockade, too, renders that pass pawn to be useless. Three, it turn, uh, the pass pawn turns out to be more weak, a weakness than a strength, which means it's uh, not. It can't be protected. It does. It can't be uh, used for any advantage. So eight. A pass pawn exists on the board, and a blockade of the pawn is often a critical importance for both sides. Will the defender manage to create a successful blockade? That's a question. Will the side with the passer manage to prevent this blockade, like we saw in Bobby Fischer's game? Games are won and lost on these things. So enter e, uh, enter such blockading battles as if your chess life depends on the outcome. So basically, when you enter a blockade, make sure, uh, as Jeremy Silman emphasized in this one section uh, summary, one of them, that you are a hundred percent sure that the blockade won't basically uh, obliterate your position and that it can actually hold. And then nine, blockading an enemy pawn is extremely important, the last one. But I left out one small piece of the puzzle. If you don't have some form of active play then you are doomed to a miserable defensive task that you probably won't recover from. So you got to see right in this last game here what we just talked about in the last summary, uh, summarized uh, kind of advice that White actually blockaded throughout the entire game, but the blockade was to none of uh, none avail. Bronstein was able to, with his bishop on c7 hold two spots and at that moment he was then able to refocus on his counterplay on the king side where black was counterplayless and white um, just ended I mean black wasn't counter I mean white was counterplayless sorry I, I said that uh, I appreciate your patience on uh, my uh, you know mishap on that one but you have to remember that it's important to make sure, again, I'm going to emphasize one more time, 
that the blockade is gives you activity and it doesn't put you in a miserable passive position where eventually your opponent's just going to slowly grind grind you down. I, I hate when that happens, but I've seen many uh, chess players have have that happen. They blockade it, but they end up getting defeated because the the blockade is passive, not an active maneuver. Okay, we'll pause here, pick up tomorrow. I think our next section is uh, other imbalances. So we're going to be looking at other imbalances tomorrow that we're going to be learning about. Okay. Remember what Bruce Lee said. Take what you know and apply it and be willing to do something with it. You're not always going to have those uh, great uh, puzzle rush battle days that you get all 100% and you win. You just got to work on your tactics. Uh, do your due diligence. Treasure your victories and then learn from your losses. Remember that mistakes don't define who you are. It's how you handle the mistake that defines who you are. Like when we, um, an example was when we got all those three wrong, we went over while the opponent was, uh, our opponent on the other side was uh, doing points or doing the puzzles. We went over and figured out why those puzzles were that way. So that next time we see a similar one over the board, are a puzzle rush battle will know exactly how to handle it. So that's that's a key concept. And like imbalances and blockades, things in your life will come up, but a very important choice that we all have to make one day is will you receive the Lord Jesus as Lord and Savior? Because eternity is a very long time. We don't have a measurement for what eternity is. But a, a small example, is if you uh, were to uh, basically, you know, slowly get every grain of sand and basically bring it inland, and you, you there's no more sand on the beaches, eternity has just begun. If you take a little eyedropper and get every sand on every beach uh, in the whole world, and you brought it in and were able to basically stack it up, and you did all that, eternity has just begun. So that's how. Uh, that's how important long eternity is, and that so just keep that in your forefront when you're thinking of making uh, your choice to receive the Lord Jesus, Lord and Savior. That that is uh, eternity is very long. That's what I should say. But remember uh, the Team Chess Cruncher motto of hanging up your coats, hanging up your hats, sitting down and studying when most won't. Team Chess Cruncher does, and that makes all the difference. As Wesley so says, through the Lord Jesus, and as I say, God bless. I'll see you next time on Chess Cruncher TV. Have a blessed morning, afternoon, evening. The Lord willing, I'll be back on tomorrow. It will keep pushing forward, moving onward and upward, and getting better. Remember, um, do you know what? Like what Hannibal Smith said, even inside of a random position, there's always a plan. So remember, like even inside, if there's a blockade, there's always a plan. Make sure, though, you find it. And then when you do and you get to implement it and you get to have some fun on that board, OTB, you get to say, I love it when a plan comes together. Okay, two thumbs up. Who Rob be blessed. Honor the Lord Jesus. Keep pushing forward and having fun. I will see you tomorrow, Team Chess Cruncher. Who Rob be blessed. I will see you. Bye bye.